on mute, please place yourself on mute and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we, again, we want to say good evening and welcome to a special Monday night happy hour. It's brought to you by the National Association of Adoptees and Parents. We were formerly Indiana Adoptee Network. Um, we recently changed our name last month and we're just excited to have so many of you here on a Monday night. So this is just a little bit about us. Uh, we wanted to remind you to please remain muted, raise your hand, your virtual hand when you, when you want to be recognized. Uh, we will have uh, an opportunity for you to ask questions. In the circle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my name is Marcy Keithley and I'm joined with Pam Krosky, uh, Jennifer Falsing in the Zoom room who will be helping out. Wave hello, ladies, say hello. And we also have Lorraine Dusky uh, that's with us in the Zoom room, especially for uh, a, little, a little special announcement here just in a little bit. But before we begin and introduce our guests, we just wanted to again, welcome all of you. If you haven't already, make sure that you do let us know where you're, uh, you're from in the chat bar and say hello. Uh, a little bit about us. You can find us online on Facebook. Um, we are napunited.org. You can visit our brand new website that we're very proud of. Make sure that you just check us out there as well. Uh, we meet here usually every Friday night uh, and Monday nights are just special. So that, that's why we're having um, uh, Gabrielle this evening with us. Um, okay, tonight's interview again, just to remind you, it will be recorded and available for replay on YouTube at a later date. For those of you that, have, that were uh, not able to join us tonight, we'll put that out. Jennifer will post that usually later on this evening. <coughs> uh, after our interview, we're gonna open it up for questions. So again, please raise your virtual hand. You'll want to definitely stay till the end of the presentation uh, because uh, Gabrielle has uh, graciously donated a autographed copy or will be uh, signing a book for those of you. We're gonna have a drawing for everyone that's attended this evening and one of you will win an autographed copy of her book. So we want you to stay with us to, to the end. So um, at this time, I wanna introduce a member of our Senior Advisory Council which is Lorraine Dusky. Lorraine, you're on mute. If you could take yourself off mute, please. Hi. And she's got, okay, go right ahead. Hello, everybody. Hey. You could hear me, right? Yes, we okay. can hear you. Go right ahead. Uh, Marcy, what do you want me to do? You asked that you said you wanted to spend, you wanted to say a little message. Oh, oh, about, oh, I wanted to say one of the things about meeting Gabrielle, um, when, of course, when you get a phone call and you've been involved in adoption and somebody's telling you they're writing an adoption book, your first question is, oh, well, I wonder what her, you know, her point of view is. So I, it, I had to find that out before I, um, plowed forward with you, Gabrielle, but I quickly found out that you knew um, a lot about adoption and you knew you had did have a point of view and it was one I jumped in with wholeheartedly. Uh, and I have to say over the course of the time she was writing the book, I feel like Gabrielle became not just somebody who was interviewing me, but a friend. We did a lot of emailing that veered into a zillion other topics and then met in New York for lunch and then went together to see Suzanne Bachner's wonderful production of um, The Good Adoptee. And then she came out here to uh, interview and just chat. And uh, so, I, I mean, she, it, the book is everything that I thought it would be. Um, it tells a such a compelling story from beginning to end because she, I mean, her, the story of how she found the story is a story that is a combination of luck and, and intelligence. I mean, I can't remember the quote that goes back uh, uh, to Pavlov, I think it's, it's, it's a combination of, of the prepared mind being ready to receive the information. And I hope she tells that story of how she met the, the, the person 
who is, became the focus of the book, and then his backstory with his uh, parents, the uh, natural parents, is sad and, and kind of just blows your mind about what this adoption agent, Louise Wise, did to the um, couple who wanted to get their son back and tried and tried and tried. But they were extremely young and the, the forces of of the, the era were against them. And so that never happened. But she tells not only their story, but goes through the whole um, history that many of us lived. And so for, I think for adoptees, particularly who aren't maybe that familiar, sometimes they, it's hard to understand what that period of time was like. And she tells the story really, really well. So I was thrilled to be a part of this and to kind of introduce you to say to Gabrielle, who is a wonderful writer and had a wonderful story to tell. Great, thank you, Lorraine. We appreciate that. Okay, at this time, I would like to go ahead and introduce uh, Gabrielle and tell you just a little bit about her. She is a New York Times bestselling author and journalist whose work on mental health, medicine and culture has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the New York Times, the Daily Beast, the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times. Uh, we are so excited about her book, uh, American Baby. I finished mine Saturday night. Um, let's show her some love in the chat bar. If you've already read the book, shout out and say yes, or if you're reading it in the process, let her know, because we really appreciate her uh, being here this evening and sharing her story uh, with us. So with that, let's give her a warm welcome to our happy hour. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for those kind words, Lorraine. Thank you for the warm welcome, Marcy. You're really welcome. appreciate it. Okay, so uh, we're going to begin the, the way that we're going to run this evening, just to let you know, I'm going to start out with a couple of questions that I would like to ask. And then we want to get a lot, obviously, hear from a lot of you because I know you have questions. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and start and then I'll turn it over and we'll, uh, we'll get some questions from the attendees. So um, again, I'm really excited that I was able to get this book and, and get it read prior to our interview. And I'm, I'm just really pleased. You know, I know the adoption community has just totally embraced you. And, uh, you, you know, I know what you put, the, put in about four years of work and research on this book. So it, it's just awesome that you're able to, to share your story. But uh, let's back up a little bit and talk about the inspiration behind the book and the significance of the title, if you could start there. I met David Rosenberg, who's the adoptee profiled in this book, who's, who's one of the, the protagonists in this book. I met him in 2007. I was a newspaper reporter in Portland, Oregon. I had covered adoption, reproductive technology. Uh, my home state of Oregon is pretty um, open-minded about a lot of different ways of forming families. So I wasn't new to the topic of adoption, which is the, one of the reasons that the story about this adopted guy needing a kidney from a friend, that was part of the reason it landed on my desk. And when I met him, he, um, he was very sick. He was needed a new kidney that he was getting from a friend. One of the first things he told me when I met him for the first time at a dialysis center was that he hoped that the story would go viral and that his birth mother would see it and recognize him as her son. It was 2007, as I said, I don't even know, if, I'm not sure if Facebook was even a thing yet, but stories were beginning to go beyond the reach of just the kitchen table and a clipping that an aunt sent you in the newspaper. And he had his arms tethered to machine that was cleaning his blood and he was very specific about his wishes and it was very simply that he wanted to be able to get more medical information for his kids and I let the story simmer I wrote the story and it, it actually inspired a lot of other people to give kidneys you know to donate kidneys as living kidney donors but it didn't go viral for him to find his mother 
And in 2014, David called me, I'd moved from Oregon to New Jersey. And he called me to say that he had taken 23 and me. He had been able to locate his birth mother. And when he told me that, he said, I hope you're sitting down. I said, yes, now I am. And he said, she didn't want to give me up. She loved me my whole life and she's been looking for me the whole time. And as a human being, as a writer, as a person on this planet, those words, the reversal of the narrative that he had been taught his whole life, that he'd been given up, that he was an inconvenience to his natural mother was reversed for a dying man. And it was impossible not to want to follow that narrative as, as I said, as a human being on this planet and to learn about the social, religious, cultural and legal forces that had led to their the separation of David Rosenberg from his birth mother, Margaret Katz, was something that had my jaw on the floor within a few months of, of starting to do research about not just their story, but the bigger, larger story that you all are familiar with, more than familiar with. It's your lived experience. So did the book start out as just wanting to share their story and then it just morphed into that? Or did you plan to just really dig deep into the history of adoption? And I had already uh, written quite a bit about adoption, as I mentioned. I'd written quite a bit about the Holt Agency, in, which is located in Oregon. And I knew I was pretty familiar with the tropes surrounding adoption in this country and how um, perplexing they can be to the people who actually live the experience. And that is that adoption is a win-win situation. That is that um, children get rescued from abroad and get to live these wonderful lives as, as new American babies. I, I was aware of, of the fallacies behind that that notion that we get presented. So when David told me about his mother and that she had been a, um, that the, and I knew that the agency had, was the Louise Wise agency. I'd known about the, the twins and triplet studies that had been out there a long time ago. It, and before the, the documentary resurfaced or the documentary came out in 2018, I, I was aware of some of their actions, but I had no idea how bad they were. And when David told me, for example, that he'd always believed that his mother was on her way to medical school. She'd been uh, positioned to him as an aspiring young scientist. She was a teenage dancer uh, at, who danced in the, the, the precursor to American Bandstand. None of what was on his identifying documents or his non-identifying documents was true. And as an investigative reporter, to me, that was a ding, 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 ding. That was a big red light. So he forwarded those to me. And when I saw them, I was, and was aware of what the truth was with this natural mother who lived 45 minutes away from me in New Jersey, I knew I wanted to dig more deeply to tell a much larger story than just the individual narrative of a birth mother and her son. And the research that you did, again, I wanna make sure I was correct, but that was over a four year period, was that correct? Yes, it was about four and a half years actually. Um, I started writing the proposal at the end of 2015, I got a contract about a year later, it took me a long time um, to really get in and find some, to really dig in and find the, the, the like the, 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 the bedrock of what adoption really meant in this country in the years after the war. So I delved into uh, Karen, Bibi, Karen, the, the Baby Scoopero book, 
I read Ann Fessler. I really educated myself on what the what that period actually meant, what was going on, what were the forces that created the forced separation of millions of mothers and their sons and daughters. And during that that time period, what would you say? I'm sure there there are more than one, but could you name one thing that really shocked you or surprised you? I mean, you know, obviously you did a lot of research before that, but while you were doing the work, what was one thing that really just stuck out that was just like, I can't believe this? Well, there were many things that really right. shocked me as, and we'll get to that later, but I think the, the, the biggest, most stunning thing was the extent to which this was a business. And that's, you asked the question earlier about the title. The title really conveys an economic system. And the system was that babies were the product. American babies, white American babies, for the most part, were a product. Is that for real? I don't know. That's not for real. It looks like someone Zoom bombed us. Mm. Yeah, that's what that was my that okay. was my guess. In mm. all all the months that we've done this, we've never had that happen. Yeah, that was my guess because I thought that 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 looked like that looked fake. Okay, so the extent to which this was a business was a shocking fact to me. The babies were the product. The mothers were the means of production and adoptive parents were tangled in this very deceptive web of what I call the adoption industrial complex. Everybody was entangled in that web. Everybody was. And what about the, uh, the challenges that you've experienced? In terms of reporting the book? Mm -hmm. For the most part, as someone who's outside adoption, I'm not personally connected to adoption. I'm not an adopted person. I'm not a natural mother. I'm not an adoptive parent. As Lorraine suggested earlier on, it, it did take a little bit of time for people, I think, to sort of try to understand where I was coming from, but I'm accustomed to that. I really did a huge examination of our rehab industry, and I'm not someone who suffers from a substance use disorder, so I'm accustomed to that. Um, but that 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 took a while. That was an understandable. But then when I started really investigating the deceptive, sinister, uh, horrific, inhumane treatment that Louise Wise perpetrated toward basically every single person who crossed their threshold, but especially adoptees, secondarily, well, equally adoptees and, and natural mothers. I, I did run into some roadblocks. There's a lot of secrecy there. There, I was warned from the beginning, look, I'm an investigator. I'm not a youngster. This is not my first time around the mulberry bush. I know how to look for stuff. I know how, where to find it. I know the questions to ask. I know the archives to dig into. That's what I love to do. I love to dig into that stuff. But I was warned, you are going to find a lot of material that has been redacted or is mysteriously missing or is blacked out. And I have to be honest, I thought, okay, all right, mm -hmm, well, maybe you don't know how to look like I, I do. I mean, I, I have to be honest, I had, I, I thought sometimes when people said that to me, all right, well, I'm, I'm gonna go find this stuff and I'll be damned if the very pages of the meeting minutes from Louise Wise Services from 1961 to 60, 1963 were all just 
missing. There's a huge, Louise, the, the one of the consulting psychiatrists at Louise Wise Services is this woman who I'm sure may be familiar to some of you. Her name is Viola Bernard. She was one of the masterminds behind this separating of twins and triplets for her infamous nature versus nurture experiments. She referred to twins and separating twins in her own files as a natural laboratory that separating twins and, and, and triplets, I mean, separating twins would be in, uh, into different homes of socio socioeconomic backgrounds would be a natural laboratory. I mean, this is a woman who was just flat out evil. And I, and yet she has volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of documents at the Columbia University Medical School Library in Uptown Manhattan. And there are documents that tell you how much she tipped a cab driver. And yet her thoughts on the certain cases, David's in particular, um, thoughts on, on uh, the pain experiments, which we'll get to completely missing. Does that make sense? Wow. You're following? <laughs> see a lot of head sure, sure I'm sure nobody's surprised about that um my last question for you before I turn it over to our, our guests uh, what was the highlight of writing American Baby the highlight was getting to know Margaret Earl Katz for one who is just an incredibly courageous tenacious young woman who was forced by her family by Louise Wise and ultimately New York state law to surrender this, this child she desperately wanted to keep. But also getting to know this larger community of people who are working so hard, have worked so tirelessly, so indefatigably to restore access to adoptees to their original birth certificates. I've had the great pleasure of going to the assembly in New York, the state assembly in New York, the state house in New York, the state house in Texas, the state house in Massachusetts. And there is something about the, that process of seeing the work required to go to these far away, in the case of Albany, in the case of Austin, these far away state houses and see the, just the, the sheer dedication required to try to overturn these secrecy laws was unbelievably humbling and really gave me just immense respect for the work you all do to try to undo the, the, the evil that has been perpetrated in our country. And that's exactly what it is too, evil. Exactly. Well, we appreciate your voice and uh, the, the incredible the job that you've done on this book to elevate all of the voices um, for all of us. Uh, but at this time, what I'd like to do is I don't want to hog all the all the questions. I'd like to open it up to others to give them the opportunity. So uh, David P was the first one that got his virtual hand up. Take yourself off mute, please. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, okay. Thank you so much for uh, putting this on and thank you, Gabrielle, for writing the book. I just received a copy recently, so I, I haven't read it yet. I will. I'm very interested in reading it as fast as possible. I had a question for you. Um, you said that the one of the most shocking things that you found was how it's a business. And without any judgment, I have to say that um, I've been seeing this commercial a lot recently and it, it's played back to back and it's also played constantly and it's called Adopt US Kids. Now, without making any judgment on that, oh, and, and just as an adoptee, it's that's so, I don't know, it's just so frustrating for me and it just gives me this horrible feeling inside about how it is just like you mentioned, a business. Um, do you have any comment on what that, that business is like today? 
I believe that that business is um, held together by a very uh, thin line in states that have large adoption agencies, large, very active, politically powerful adoption agencies, uh, states that have mysteriously are just happen to be a hop, skip and a jump away. Crisis pregnancy centers happen to be miraculously linked to some of those large adoption agencies. So um, I was actually hoping to investigate more of that before the pandemic started. And I, my big hope is to be able to return to that as soon as it's safe to travel again, um, particularly in the South where, as we all know, some of those large adoption agencies are, are alive and flourishing. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Yes, yeah. thank you. Shelly Weber has a question. Shelly, if you want to take yourself off mute. <clears throat> okay, I think I'm off mute. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to find out in the book, I don't know if it ever said if um, David ended up meeting his other sister. I know he had one sister that I didn't recall them mentioning. Uh, no, I, I mentioned very clearly that he had two sisters. Um, uh, he had three other siblings, but only one was able to go to Oregon and meet him. He was very ill at the time of the reunion and having located his, his, um, his natural mother. So only one of those, uh, only one of his siblings was able to actually make that journey. And he died, and he, he died three months after after they were able to reunite. Okay, after that, when they talk, when you talked about other family continuing the relationship, do you know if that sister made connections with anyone else in the family? Um, I'm not, I believe she did. Um, wh what makes you ask? Um, I was just wondering, because at the end of the book, I was, I was listening to an audio book while I was doing other things. And when it was over, I'm like, I don't know if the other sister got mentioned. I can't remember her name. Yeah, the, she, she's mentioned in the book. Lisa is mentioned in the book. Yeah, no, I mean, just at the end of she ended up connecting with his, you know, with his birth family as well. I just thought about her later in the book and I was like, oh, I wonder if she got to meet the birth family or not. Oh, um, I don't think she has met them yet, but okay. life, is, life is long <laughs> and maybe, maybe they will. Yeah, that was my question, if, if they had met yet. And in person? No, I don't, I, don't, okay. I don't believe so, no. Okay. Thank you, Anne, you can go ahead and take yourself off mute and ask your question. I was just wondering um, if you've received any pushback from adoptive parents who adopted during that time frame. I just saw that question. I, I have, actually. Um, wh when the... The weekend that the book came out, it was it got a big review in the New York Times book review. And before people had even ever read it, I my email was flooded with e with really angry letters from adoptive parents from that era who essentially said one after the other, "How dare you? How dare you? We gave these kids good homes. How dare you?" So I bet I expected that. Right. Well, thank you. I appreciate the book was amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Lorraine, did you have something you wanted to say? You're still on mute. Lorraine. Uh, Gabrielle, I would love for you to talk about some of the experiments that they did on the babies. I found that um, really horrifying um, how they just decide, you know, we're trying to decide if the babies were, quote, intelligent enough to be adopted. And then the, um, the story continued with the babies being part of the training. I think it was at Cornell. Uh, and so could, tell us about that, because that that to me was a new chapter in uh, how low can you go? Louise Wise really prided itself on 
its ability to quote unquote match a baby with the appropriate parents. And there were uh, doctors on Louise, on the Louise Wise board. There was one named Samuel Karolitz, who was a well-known New York pediatrician who had a harebrained theory that the babies who cried the most were the most intelligent. And in order to test this harebrained theory, he actually got, can you hear me? I can, but I can't. I lost the video and I can't figure out how to get back in. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. we can see you. You can see me? Yes. Okay, I can't see anybody, but. <laughs> we can hear you and see, we can hear you and see you. Okay. Okay, so um, he, in order to test this theory, he actually got funding from the US government, from the National Institutes of Health to conduct a study that induced pain in babies who were 10 minutes old and actually it tested them from the time they were 10 minutes until they were uh, at, at least three months old. And what the, the test did was take a rubber band gun, the kind of rubber band that you would take a, ru take a rubber band, a thick rubber band about the, the width of the, a rubber band that you would get around a big thick pile of mail. It stretched the rubber band to three times its regular size and shot it at this, the tender sole of a 10 minute old infant and then measured the cries. And if the cries, uh, if the baby didn't cry for 60 seconds the first time, the researchers would continue this induced crying experiment at least seven more times. And I know this is triggering. It makes me sick to think about it. It made me sick to read about it. It made me sick to write about it. But these studies went on and I'm sorry, I know they're ho horrible and seeing some faces and how could there be any other reaction but this? But these studies were funded for 15 years and, re and, and, and were conducted from 1957 and the last article published about them was in 1974. They were praised by the popular press I think a lot of people may, might remember the pop psychologist, Dr. Joyce Brothers. Does anybody remember her? Yes. Uh, she was like sort of the, you know, doctor version of Dear Abby. And she praised these, these experiments as a useful tool in being able to match adoptive adoptees with the proper parents and also as a sort of you know reassurance to parents who might have had a colleague kid oh don't worry if he's crying too much he's going to grow up to be really smart so there that to me Lorraine was and everybody was my jaw is still on the floor and Carolitz himself in discussing the testing described a uh, having ruled out an electric prod, having ruled out a heat prod, and then compromising on this rubber band gun. And you just have to think, wow, if the, the, the board of Louise Wise sat around a table and listened to this and then okayed it, and then he then successfully sought and won grants from the United States government. What was going on? And this was a period after which the United States, 10 years after which the United States had signed the Nuremberg Code. And the Nuremberg Codes called for the establishment of informed consent. So anybody who is, that's why you have to sign a form before you get any sort of treatment. You sign, we don't read them, right? But we still sign them on our HIPAA forms. If you, if you participate in any sort of a study, you have to sign these forms. And who was signing those forms? The babies were the custody of Louise Wise Services. So the very child welfare agency entrusted with caring for those surrendered sons and daughters 
was actually actively seeking to inflict pain. And if that isn't shocking, I don't know what is. There's a lot that's shocking about a lot of things our country has done and respected institutions have done, but that, is, that, 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 that will never, that will haunt me for the end of my days until the end of my days. Uh, I still can't see, but there's another, if, if, if it's okay that I'll ask another question. I think that many people here would like to know a little more detail about how uh, hard um, David's mother and father tried to keep their son. There were so many, I mean, that just was a wrenching part of the book for me. It was a different story, very different story than mine and, and many women, but, but that seemed to me just heartbreak, especially at the very end when, when his mother finally gives up. Could you tell us in a little more detail than you did before about that? Sure. Margaret Earl Katz was the daughter of German Jewish refugees in Upper Manhattan in 1961. She fell in love with a handsome baseball player who was the son of two Holocaust survivors from Vienna. They were a year apart. They went to the same high school. They fell in love. Margaret got pregnant the first time that she ever had sex. She didn't even know she'd really had sex because of course, as so many of you know from that era, there was virtually no birth control. There was no sex education. The sexual revolution was simmering and abortion was, yet, was not yet legal. And so Margaret's parents, the, but neither set of parents liked the other kid. And George Katz uh, had a baseball scholarship. He was on his way to Ohio State and his parents had a, a girl picked out for him who was of a different class. The Katzes had uh, a, more money, more education and, and Margaret just, they looked down their noses at Margaret. But that didn't matter. This young couple was absolutely in love. They did everything they could to try to keep their baby. They eloped. They went to South Carolina because that was a place where you didn't need a blood test and George was afraid of needles. They, George surrendered his uh, baseball scholarship to try to stay by Margaret's side. They did everything they could to convey their fitness as, as, as parents. And one thing that was just heartbreaking to me was that George, as an, as an athlete, they would go to arcades and George would use his baseball arm to win weighted to do these games with weighted targets and instead of trying to impress his girl with big teddy bear the these teenagers would get blenders and cutlery and uh, 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 corning ware and pyrex dishes to and then take polaroid photographs of them to show social workers, look, we may look like we're just kids, but look, we've got our kitchen stuff. We can take care of this baby. And of course, as soon as he was born, as so many of you who are first moms experienced, Margaret was not able to hold him. He was immediately taken from her. And regardless of her, of her attempts working through the system, trying to convince everybody, ultimately, she uh, was no match for New York state law, which at that time until 1971 uh, cr had criminalized premarital sex. So despite her pleadings, despite her absolute refusal to even look at the papers that were being shoved in front of her, the last straw was a social worker who said, a diplomat wants to adopt your son this week. You're a teenager, you've got nothing to offer him. And by the way, if you don't do this, we're going to throw you in juvie. And she just, at, at that point, she, she couldn't, she capitulated. She couldn't, she didn't have any, any, any steam left. All that was precipitated because she, I mean, she, they went back several times. It wasn't like it just to happen on the telephone. They actually showed up. Yes, they, they, they went to see their son. They were able social services used it as a sort of carrot to get if a mother had been recalcitrant in not signing the papers immediately, 
they would dangle the possibility of her being able to see her child in a social services setting. And the first time Margaret and George did that, their son was three months old. And the second time he was five and a half months old, she was a month away from her 18th birthday and there and would have been a legal adult in New York, but of course had no legal representation, didn't understand the finality of what adoption meant, really didn't understand. And she had no idea what she was signing. Not, not at all. They also had, she also had parents who didn't accept this either. I mean, the mother was really pushing this. Oh, the mother was horrified. Horrible. And, yeah, uh, yeah, really called her all sorts of terrible names and, and just was scandalized and shamed and added to the shame that she already felt within her own society. As so many of you have written about, this was a shameful secret to become pregnant out of wedlock and out of wedlock. What does that word even mean? I mean, it sounds so archaic, out of wedlock. To, to become pregnant and not be married was on the shoulders of a young woman alone. Well, I found that part of the story really personally hard to read um, just because it was, you told it so well and it was so incredibly sad because you just see this machinery clamping down on, on Margaret as she desperately tries to, with George. I mean, it wasn't like she, Margaret was alone. She had George. Um, and, and it just is this going to this inevitable end. And you, you I mean, you know the horror. The, the other thing that um, I was interested in was the similarities that were found uh, once the families were connected. For instance, uh, the, the singing um, aspect and that his sister was an opera singer in Berlin. Um, you might want to talk about that. Yes, and I know so many people who are in the adoption community talk about the synchronicities that and coincidences that occur in adoption. So David was adopted by a Romanian Holocaust survivors who loved him very, very much and he them. And they were not diplomats and they were not raising him overseas. Incidentally, Margaret and George, when they did marry, they settled in the Bronx. 10 blocks from where David lived with his adoptive parents, the Rosenbergs. And uh, Ephraim Rosenberg was a renowned cantor who is a, uh, that is a, a, a Jewish leader of the community who leads the community in prayer and song, a very, very respected position to have in, in a synagogue. And David was, was educated with a very, very deep foundation in Judaism, but also had exposure to this great man's voice. And David too had an absolutely celestial voice. It was like listening to something that was coming from heaven. And when he met Margaret, for the first time in May of 2014, when they connected by telephone, he said, number one, he and David had also become um, a very, very uh, successful hockey player. He had grown up, his, he had moved with the Rosenbergs to Toronto and David had become just this amazing goalie who was recruited by the Rangers to be a goalie in New York. George Katz's fav favorite sports team were the New York Rangers. He had season tickets. So just think about that, wrap your mind around that. He could have, I know so many of you have these reunion stories where you have these similarities, but if David had chosen that path, it's possible that his own birth father would have watched him play hockey. It, on on his own favorite team. David did not take that route. He became a cantor himself and had a career as a cantor in, in, in Portland, Oregon, which is of course where I met him. And his when he talked to his mother, he said, well, when he talked to Margaret for the first time when they reunited, he said, tell me about the, the athletic ability we have in our family. Of course, she talked about the baseball and, and, and George's love of hockey. 
And he said, what about the singing ability? And she said, I don't know. We lost so many family members in the Holocaust. I don't really have an answer for that. But your baby sister is a famous opera singer in Berlin. And the two of them had this connection that they really, they really understood each other after 52 years apart. Well, David was 52 when he died and Sherry was quite a bit younger, many, many, many years younger. But these two siblings, full siblings had developed parallel careers. And this, this is not like, oh, two people who happen to become journalists, which is un would be unusual itself. These are two people who developed and made a living from their voices. That's really something quite stunning to me and remains stunning. Yeah, genetics for you, exactly. Um, earlier, Lorraine, you had asked about the the uh, practice babies that yeah. became at Cornell University. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't yeah. know about them. Yeah, tell us about uh, them. Uh, Cornell University developed a series of what they called practice homes starting in 1919 that used uh, babies who had come in those days, they there, there were very few adoption agencies. They were just beginning to, to, um, to develop in New York City, but certainly in upstate New York Bay, they home act departments at this, uh, starting at Cornell, as I said, used children who had come from orphanages as practice babies for home act majors who lived in these homes that where they learned to keep the finances, they learned to, uh, clean the house properly, they learn to iron properly, they learn to sew properly. And they also pass these babies around as if they were footballs. So the babies would be on loan from originally from orphanages, and then later from adoption agencies. And home ec students would care for the children, sometimes on a weekly basis, the, the, the mother figure would be the same for a week. But more frequently on an hour to hour or two hour to two hour uh, chunk of time. And these practice homes existed in 50 different uh, universities nationwide. And I actually found some documentation for them at Oregon State University in Corvallis where 1500 girls, home ec students, cared for 50 babies over a period of, I think about 35 or 40 years, as long as those practice homes were in, in, in use. And just think about the impact on a tiny infant. The women recorded, the girls recorded how much spinach they had, how much canned peas they had, how much formula they drank. But it really, I didn't see any documentation of any kind that indicated anyone was giving a single thought to the emotional development of these babies in their care. If there is, is there anyone else? I have another thing I wanted to mention, but I don't wanna be hogging the question and I can't see, I still can't see the screen. Yeah, we have two more questions that are holding. Okay, go for that. Okay, uh, David Bull, will you take yourself off of mute, please? Sure, thank you, Marcy. Hi, Gabrielle. Um, thank you so much for telling this important story and including such an in-depth analysis. I um, started at the prologue on page one and didn't put it down until uh, I completed it because although uh, David's circumstances and mine were much different, you were telling my story and I thank you for that. Um, as I was reading through it, I kept thinking about your earlier book, Her Best Kept Secret, and how you talked about finding new and effective ways to help women who are struggling with alcohol use problems. And I was really saddened to think in 2013 that they were new and effective ways. We should have known better by then. We should have known a lot more. And as I was reading your book, I kept thinking, boy, there's so many parallels between addiction and recovery and relinquishment and adoption. I'm wondering if you might have learned anything in your studies previously in that previous book that might be applied to the adoption community that might be helpful 
for us to get those strategies into play, those evidence-based strategies. Certainly David's story was just the opposite. He was, he was, he was the victim of, of so many um, malpractice um, characteristics that, that people had, had employed, so, so many um, wrongful uh, uses of, of power and so many wrong decisions. There were no evidence-based practices that helped him. Were there any things that you learned in that first book or Best Kept Secret that you might apply or share with the adoption community that might be helpful to us today? Well, thank you for that, uh, David. I, I really appreciate that. One of the biggest things that I learned about looking, when I did look at, at women and, and drinking issues was that there was a myth about that as well. And the myth was there's one way to get better and if you don't do that, if you don't don't join a uh, faith and abstinence based program, then your life is is not you're, you're you're sunk. And while those are effective for a great many number of people who 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 try them and who swear by them and who who whose lives um, have been completely helped by those strategies, I did find an immense number of, as you said, evidence-based treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, uh, drugs. There's a certain drug called naltrexone that helps people with cravings and just things that were hiding in plain sight, but that because we had accepted this narrative that if you have developed a substance use disorder, there's one way to get help. That to me was very parallel to the win-win-win that is, was the narrative, the adoption narrative that I was also had certainly grown up with. That mm -hmm. here are these children, their mothers can't care for them. They were illegitimate and they're going to go to nice married people who are going to raise them as their own and everything's going to be absolutely fine and no reason to ever look back. So I also did find, of course, as you well know, um, there are adoptees and birth parents have much greater prevalence of developing sub substance use disorders than people who are not adopted or, or have surrendered a child. So that was also something that was, it wasn't surprising to me at all. When I learned it, it, it just, it seemed to make a lot of sense. There's so much pain that sometimes can't find a, a, a proper way to heal. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. You did, thank you. Okay, next up is Rich Erlob. You there, Rich? Yes, thank you for helping me unmute. I was uh, struggling with my screen. Uh, thank you so much, Gabrielle, for this book. I'm really excited about all of the positive press and great reviews it's getting. I guess my question is has two parts. Uh, one, how have you garnered such fantastic uh, press on this and all the great reviews other than being a well-written book? I'm looking forward to reading it. And two, have you been in touch with the people involved with uh, Three Identical Strangers? And is there any collaborative effort to hold the Louise Wise Agency accountable in some way? Uh. Uh, the Louise Wise Agency, as you may know, went bankrupt in 2004. So the possibility of holding them accountable is, is that that unfortunately is no longer, you know, on the horizon at all. And I have not been in touch with the three identical strangers folks. This, I was, you know, as, as amazed as I was by the telling of that story, I, I felt like that really focused on the three brothers and that one singular experiment and not the larger tale of what happened during the baby scoop era. 
So I touch on it in the book, as you may know, uh, but I don't, I felt that three identical strangers did a good job of telling that story. And even, even uh, perhaps more completely, a woman named Lori Shinseki who wrote, who uh, did a documentary called The Twinning Reaction that came out right around the same time. It didn't get quite the uh, amount of press that Three Identical Strangers did. It focused on the twins and she really delved into some of the, the she found some of the researchers who were involved in separating those kids and studying them. And I would urge you to, to watch it if you haven't. I see a question here about the numbers. Um, yeah, I, as you may know, Christine, uh, the, the question is about, Ann Fessler calls, says that there were 1.5 million women from the post-World War II era who were sent away. Uh, if you look at the data on, it's a woman and I, I cite it and I go through all of the reasons why I do give that 3 million figure. There is a woman named Penelope Maza who studied adoptions between 1944 and 1975. And she came up with about 3.5, 3 3.7, million adoptees, most of which were not in family adopt adoptions, most of which were not step parents, but they were stranger adoptions. And also Ricky Solinger talks about mm -hmm. 30 to 40% of adopt uh, of adoptions in the baby scoop era being black market, not registered, not followed by any state. And again, the, the Maza number was incomplete, not all states complied, not all states contributed their data for tracking adoptions. And it was a 30 year experiment where the federal government actually did try to gather statistics on adoption. And I think they, they I don't know why they gave up. Rudy Owen is really terrific on this and holding the country accountable for not doing it. But I think because the data were so incomplete, they just gave up. So I hope that answers your question, Christine. It uh, does. Okay, Thank good. You. I know it's an, a near impossible number, I think, to quantify. Um, but I, I really loved your book uh, and I'm intrigued. I've done a lot of research on the Catholic side of things and um, hadn't read a lot about Louise Wise and I was fascinated to, to read that in particular. That part of the story. Did you see the the second part of my question? One of the things that surprised me, and something that I heard in doing research for something I'm working on, is there's still adoptive parents today that are not telling their children that they've been adopted. Um, and a, a organization that does adoption competent therapy training um, was alarmed to when they had a federal grant to do that study to find out that there were still parents who weren't telling their kids that. Did you encounter any of that? Or have you, heard, I'm guessing too, that might be why you're getting the pushback you are. <laughs> I have only heard from a few late discovery adoptees. Um, one thing that I'm gonna leap forward to is sperm donations and egg donations and people being secretive about that and thinking that they have a right to be secretive about that and withholding from their sons and daughters conceived with assisted reproductive technology that their original biological origins, it's gonna backfire. And um, I did not run into a lot of, of people who were not aware that they were adopted. Certainly David was, um, and I didn't, that wasn't really a focus, but I do, I hear, on Twitter and by email, everyone probably once or twice a week, somebody who's who lets me know that they only just discovered that mm -hmm. they were adopted, or that their that their birth father wasn't their birth father, and you know that their the father they were raised with wasn't their mm -hmm. birth father. So, I got a letter today from a, a woman whose sister had surrendered 
through Catholic charities mm -hmm. in very similar circumstances to Margaret and in Connecticut, which is still a closed state for many people who were born, I believe, between 1944 and 1983. Uh, the woman, the birth mother had left copious contact information for her daughter, got in February of this year, uh, of last year, actually a year ago, got diagnosed with stage four cancer thinking she would never reunite with her ch child, her, her adult daughter. You know, you know this story, 23andMe led to a discovery. She gets an email from her, her daughter and the woman's name, I don't wanna give the name, but the woman with the, the natural mother said, did you not receive the, 49 years of documentation that I left for you at Catholic Charities in Hartford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And the woman said, not one word, not one word. And luckily they, have, they haven't met yet, but the woman's cancer is in remission and she Zooms with her daughter almost every night. And as soon as they get their jabs, I think they're going to be able to reunite. I, I hope that's, I hope that that happens, but. Yeah, I mean, as, as outrageous as, as, as what I discovered Mar that Margaret and David experienced, every day I hear more hair-raising, harrowing, horrific tales of religious institutions that are guilty of affinity fraud. You think, oh, Louise, Wa and I'm Jewish, so I can, you know, I, I don't have a problem saying this. Louise Wise, nice Jewish agency founded by the wife of a famous rabbi. What could go wrong? Well, a lot, a lot. Same with Catholic charities, same with Protestant organizations, same with the Salvation Army. It's nation, as you, it's, as you know, as you all know, it's, uh, it was a nationwide uh, system hiding in plain sight. Okay, I believe Wendy is next and then Kim. Wendy, would you please take yourself off mute? Hi, um, Gabrielle, I was just curious if anything, any subjects or topics came up through your research that you're interested in further investigating and writing about in the future. Oh, I am really fascinated by the way families put themselves together and I'm fascinated by the ongoing uh, the ongoing desire to create the perfect family. Louise Wise promised prospective adoptive parents with the perfect baby by doing these horrific tests to, to, to gauge their intelligence as we discussed. But I don't see a lot of distance between egg donors and sperm donors who get the, you know, super high SAT scores or who are pre-med students. I saw a story today about egg donors who, uh, it was a story in Slate about women who are donating their eggs in order to pay off their college debt. Right. And one woman, several women actually have gone through at least 19 cycles of uh, going through the whole uh, egg harvesting thing, which just was shocking mm -hmm. to me. I don't know if I'll pursue that. I think a lot of people are sort of looking at, at, at assisted reproductive technology and it's wild westism, but it certainly interests me. I hope that, that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, next we have Kim. Did I hear Kim? <clears throat> I put a question in the chat. Um, you know, currently all kinds of people um, 
I don't know if the timeline has stopped, but um, adults who uh, as children had been sexually assaulted or currently or more or recently been able to go all the way back and um, follow up either civilly or criminally. And I'm wondering if there are any efforts to, um, you know, I know we have child abuse laws. I know we now have IRBs and research protocols, but are there any, in, during, during your investigative pieces, did you come across any efforts to criminalize this behavior or, or any, um, because I've, I've talked to a couple a couple different lawyers to ask if there would be any pathway where I could sue in civil court. And in both case, I didn't go very far with it, but in both cases, <clears throat> I was told, no, absolutely not. And I'm not sure if I believe that. That is a really great question. I know that people tried to go after Louise Wise and were turned away. Uh, number one, initially the the triplets, the, uh, the adoptive parents of the triplets tried to sue and the cases were turned down because nobody wanted to cross Louise Wise in case maybe somebody wanted to, uh, a, a, an associate in that same firm wanted to adopt one day. That was the reason given, but that was in the early 1980s. Ultimately, there were a couple of lawsuits they were not successful. Um, I know that the triplets have tried to, I don't know if they have a lawsuit at the Jewish Board of Guardians in New York State, but that would be just brainstorming. That would be a, a clear avenue that and Catholic charities that and, you know, if you can, but taking on the Catholic church, you think, hmm, okay, I saw your, your eyes, your eyebrow but the Catholic Church did get taken on. And I think it might be worth talking to some lawyers who have done that and have done that successfully. If you wanna message me offline, I know a lawyer who uh, has been very successful in doing that in Portland, going after the, both the Boy Scouts and mm -hmm. the church. So. Yeah. I, I have not re yet read your book, I intend to. Um, so I don't, does, um... Did you include anything in relationship to private adoptions, the private adoption industry? I did not go down that route because there, uh, there was enough of, of a behemoth in front of me with Louise Wise and the documentation for that, the paper trail of, of that was significant and really uh, a trove that I could go back to. And with private adoptions, as I'm sure you know, there's no, you know, oftentimes there's no trace. There's no, you know, I know people who, who, whose birth certificates are, they, they didn't even get an original birth certificate issued. It was such a, a sort of um, shady backdoor deal that it was, okay, the doctor knows the girl and knows the parents with whom he's going to place the child. And, oh, let's just make an original birth certificate. And to, to that end, Christine, though, uh, you know, a lot of people adopted in, in the, um, uh, who were born outside of hospitals in an, er in an earlier era, I did definitely run into some of that, but yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't look into the private adoption. I didn't, I didn't, just didn't have the bandwidth to go all the way down those trails. But there's certainly more to look at. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay, um, Nancy. Well, Gabrielle, I had a similar question about the private adoption um, during the 50s and 60s. Um, I'm a late discovery adoptee and it was done through a private arrangement um, of which I was told my adoptive mother, um, excuse me, my adoptive grandmother paid a high sum to a private attorney for being able to arrange the adoption. And, um, and the money apparently went to my maternal grandmother instead of my mother. So it just, it's just curious to me. I, I started doing the research and found the attorney that is in my adoption file 
but um, can't find any records except for that he was listed with the Cradle Society in Evanston. Um, so apparently I called the Cradle Society and got a um, kind of a special consultation and they said uh, basically that he um, might have been a lawyer at the time that did, you know, that they used as kind of an external contractor. Mm -hmm. that he may have done private things on the side. And so I just wondered if you, I'm, I'm curious because I was in healthcare too and I'm just thinking, you know, was there any money exchange? Was anything happening through the hospitals to arrange this? You know, has the, any of that been uncovered? To my knowledge, no, but I am sure it is ripe for investigating. And I know that doctors, for example, got a kickback for referring, I don't know for 100%, you know, I, I, I can't say, you know, with 100% certainty that certain doctors got kickbacks for sending, referring young women to Louise Wise. But after a while, when you see these guys over and over and over and over again in the files, you think, hmm, that's interesting. And they all would offer the same promise that Margaret's doc doctor offered to her. The same doctor who referred her to Louise Wise said, you know what, sweetie, come back to me when you're married, when you're married and pregnant, and I'll, I'm going to make this go away now. And I'm going to make your, the birth certificate of your second child appear as if it will, as if you are a first time mother. So there was so much, I mean, talk about the fraud that adoptees have with their amended birth certificates being, you know, listing their adoptive parents as their original mother and father and their adoptive name is their original name. And then you have these doctors. I mean, it was a whole system of secrecy. Doctors literally promising, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put you down as a first time mother the second time when you have a baby the second time. So the, the, and the, the fear that your secret was going to be out just Enormous. So I'm, I'm, did you meet your maternal grandmother? No, no. I found my birth mother, but my maternal grandmother had passed. Was she aware of this transaction? She said she was aware of it and she, she did not receive the money for it. Oh, it, it was, it was taken so painful. Yeah. It's really sad. And and yet I can, can see how that transpires. So. Oh, I think it transpires today. I think yeah. the adoption system today offers these young women uh, a condo and a pool and a car and a cell phone if they don't have one. And it's very coercive. It's, it's, it's deeply coercive, particularly if they're private adoptions. Thank you so much for the research you've done. Oh, I'm, it was my honor. Okay, How, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I was just looking at Tina Brown's uh, question to me. Writing this book, I was angry a lot of the time. I didn't realize it. I, I just would just lose my temper a lot and I'm not proud of that and I think now that the writing of the book is behind me and that it's getting out there into the world and I have a larger uh, place to share the horrible things that I found I feel some of that dissipating and I, I'll just put it this way. I was really, um, I was really, 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 I got really close to Margaret and I'm so lucky about that. And hearing her story, understanding what she went through, understanding what so many of you have experienced, 
understanding what adoptees are told, understanding what adoptees are led to believe in their lives made me really angry. And I'm just so, I feel so grateful that, that this project is, is, is getting out there in a way that makes other people stand up and take notice people from outside the adoption community. Because what happened is a story about a mother and her son, but it's a story about, it's really a story about America. And this is something that happened in our lifetimes. It happened in, it happened in your lives. And to, to explore it fully, yeah, it changed me. It did. How do we, oh, Bernie. Here's my new friend, Bernie. Bernie, hi, Bernie. Uh, I so appreciate that. I would love it if you folks could write reviews on Amazon, if you could tell as many people as you can about the importance of this book, share it with people within your community, uh, outside your community, on social media. Just, just the more people who know about this, the more likely we are to be able to change the secrecy laws that are still in place in so many states. Thank you for your question, Bernie, and thank you for joining us tonight. Okay, do we have any other questions or final comments? Lorraine, you did said, have one thing you wanted to share. Yeah, well, I was interested in the blowback that you're getting from ad adoptive parents or any, I don't know, of agencies or, um, because I know this, I'm going to tell a little story out of school here. I know that you were going to interview uh, Jane Edwards, who I have been blogging with uh, when you were a newspaper reporter, and then you hurriedly canceled it just before you were supposed to come over. And she uh, suspected that it wasn't you who canceled the, the, the your, your, your excuse was your, another story came up. Remember this? <laughs> I, I do, I do remember that. And, and I, I did absolutely have pressure to, to sort of let go of the adoption stories that I was writing about. And I right. have gotten uh, a lot of pushback from, this was in the early 2000s. So uh, I had written a story about Korean American adoptees have been adopted from Holt. That's sort of what launched my whole interest in adoption. And there was immense pushback at the newspaper. A lot of adoptive parents uh, were furious with me. They threatened mm -hmm. to cancel their subscriptions. And, but I, I really, I think, I think I was trying to go to an AAC conference or maybe a Cub conference. It wasn't that I canceled the interview. It was that I couldn't go, I, that my memory is that I couldn't go, I really wanted to go to one of these conferences and there just wasn't the, mm. the money in the budget for me to travel because it was yeah. a, a flight to, I think it was in California at the time and I was in Portland, so. I mean, I was interested in that because I, being the mother who everybody, um, the adoptive parents love to hate and have been out publicly since 75, I'm very aware of, um, nasty letters and people saying things to my face and I'm adoptive. I mean, you quote one of the juiciest ones when an adoptive grandfather told me that I was their worst nightmare at a dinner party while the hostess was in the other room getting the dessert. I mean, it was, you know, she came in and we like carried on. Oh. And I've since been in his wife, I guess he never told his wife about this, but she wasn't at this dinner. They then invited me to dinner and uh, I um, told was, I was saying no. I just get, kept coming up with an excuse um, because I I think the wife is not aware. And these actually are the parents of the a man who wrote the book called The Brotherhood of Joseph, which is about why they chose to adopt from Russia and Siberia rather than adopt from the United States, so they would not have to 
deal, his wife would not have to deal with saving a seat for the birth mother at their daughter's, uh, at a dance recital. Mm. So the book is really about why they chose to go overseas. It's, um, life is very weird, but pushback is something I'm really um, familiar with. That's why I was, when I first spoke to you, I was like, okay, <laughs> what is your story? But you immediately uh, put me at ease and I ended up liking you immensely. <laughs> <laughs> I lucked out. Thank you for yeah. that. Thank you. <laughs> you deserve it, my dear. Oh, thank you. I thank love you the so book. Much. Oh. And, and as you said, you know, getting the word out. I mean, I mean, that's the whole reason I came out. And it's it's always really good to just keep you know, it's not, it's not enough to just share it among ourselves. I mean, we can make change when the, when the more people in, in the wider world know about it, when it won't be, you know, when it will be unacceptable for somebody to say you are our worst nightmare and your book can go a long way to, to doing that. So as you said, you know, give Gabby all these good reviews on Amazon, tell people not involved in adoption about it foist it on them, if you will, um, after you read it. I mean, by, I was not, I was surprised. It's, I, I didn't know about the baby testing, which is kind of when, you know, I kind of, we were emailing each other at the time I was reading the book. And I just was like, I was reading it out loud to Tony, my husband. And then at, by the end, in the last chapter, I, I, I cried, but I mean, I do cry all the time, but you know, I, the last chapter is really beautiful, Gabrielle. Thank you so much. I am so, I'm really so delighted to, I'm trying to read this uh, 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 the, the, in the chat and, and make eye contact. It's, uh, I, I'm just so honored to, to, to be among you tonight and to have had this resonate and to, to, be able to, to be able to have told this story was really the challenge and honor of my entire life. And I mean that, I mean that. <laughs> Well, we're honored to have you this evening, and I, I, I think I speak for all of us. I mean, just congratulations on your work. It's just fabulous. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I know we had one we had one additional comment and one quick question if we could squeeze in. Sure. We have a moment for that. Uh, Mary Jordan had a comment. And I think Hi. Ian also had a question. So Mary, if you'll quickly make your comment and then we can- you know, you know, when you were talking about um, in the private adoptions, um, when an original birth certificate wouldn't even be made. Um, I've done many, many, um, I've helped a lot of people doing searches and I'm the only person I know who had three birth certificates. And the second one, which was the one my mom sent with me to school whenever they needed it, I remember it. It was this little green piece of paper that I took to school. And, um, you know, it showed them as my parents. And if I go to the courthouse now, um, it's not the same birth certificate. It has different information on it. It says that I was born in the town where I live now. Um, the green one that I took to school um, had, a, had the town where my mother, my birth mother lived when I was born. And my original, when I finally got it, shows that I was born where I was actually born. Now, the green one that I took to school all the time got lost somehow. And I thought, I want to cop that. So I called Vital Records in Indiana. It doesn't exist. Oh, it was falsified. So that green one, who made that up? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And what state documents are green? Exactly, yeah. 
I, you know, because, you know, now that I'm older, I'm like, God, I, does that, did there, anybody's birth certificate look like that at all? You know, or was mine the only green one in the state? <laughs> um, but, you know, I, it's nice to listen to somebody talk the way you do who, like you said, is not touched by adoption. They're mean, I mean, anytime the subject comes up and I bring it up a lot when I'm talking to people and I educate, educate, educate. You know, I mean, my aunt is 82 years old and I've talked to her a lot here recently. And she, she keeps telling me all the time, she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I had no idea what adoptees go through, you know, <laughs> but okay. Well, and I get to, I get to listen to you speak on Sunday too. So <laughs> oh, good, good with the English books. Good, good. <laughs> and I'll read the book before then too. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you so much. Thank you yeah, so much. Mary. Okay, real quick, um, Ann Criswell, I'll let you ask the last question. Great. Um, this has been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity, and Gabrielle, thank you. I haven't finished the book yet, but I'm actually listening to the audio version. Oh, good. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, to finishing the book soon. Uh, but I am interested in the last name of the researcher Penelope that you referenced earlier. Oh, it's Maza, M-A-Z-A. -A. And you can message me privately. I'll, I'll, I have a link to her data in, in, in the footnotes. Okay, great. Great, I'll do that. Yeah. Thank and you again. It's also on the um, Ellen Herman's Adoption History website, if you're familiar with that. Oh, oh. Uh, Ellen Herman at the University of Oregon has a website, really uh, comprehensive website called the Adoption History Project. And mm -hmm. that statistic is uh, available there. If you go under statistics, you can find that number there. And you'll see those incomplete state, the incomplete state data. That's frustrating. Okay, so, great. Yeah. great. Thank you so much. Of course, my pleasure. Okay, um, one last question for you. Uh, what's the best way for readers to, in to interact with you? Oh, find me on Twitter. Thank you for Twitter? asking me okay. that. Twitter or Facebook. Twitter I'm Facebook. at Gabrielle Glazer, uh, either one. I'm terrible on Instagram. I never post anything there. Okay. So don't look for me there. <laughs> if you will, if you do, you will be disappointed. So Facebook and, and, and Twitter. But okay. So. Right. Okay. Well, uh, again, we want to thank you for, for spending your evening with us. We are uh, thrilled to have you on. At this time, we do have a winner that we'd like to announce uh, for to receive an autographed copy of your book. So Pam, will you take yourself off a of mute? I'm off. I was seeing if she was still on here. Well, we have to be here to win. Oh, she is. She is still Yay. here. Yay. The winner is Barbara Young. Barbara Young. Yay. Barbara, will you take yourself off a of mute and introduce yourself real quick? What? I didn't even know I was in the drawing. Oh my God. Barbara. I'm so excited. Yay. Wow. Yay. Oh my gosh. Congratulations. I'm Thank you. Because I was like, wow, I'm going to read that book. <laughs> <laughs> How do yeah. I get it? How do I get it? We'll, I, we'll, send it? we'll send it to you. We'll oh, get your address thanks. and mail it to you. Thank you. And thank you, Gabrielle. That was awesome. I'm sorry that I was late. I couldn't get on to the site. It was. <laughs> <laughs> I but lost I'm, internet. Thank you. Two, I lost internet two minutes before the whole thing started. So uh, yeah. it was a bit of a it's panic. One of those nights. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, for those of you again that have joined us for the first time, if you'd like to come back and visit us on our regular scheduled Friday night, please feel free to do so. We'd love to have you back. Yeah. Uh, we do, David, do you have just a quick second to, to, to share about our, our meeting? 
your bi-monthly meeting? Certainly, yes. Every two weeks, the National Association of Adoptees and Parents sponsors an <clears throat> adoptees recovery meeting. It's held virtually on Zoom at 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific time. Our next meeting will be February 23rd. Uh, all adoptees are welcome, but also families and friends. Information is in the chat box if you need some links or you can find us on Facebook. Thank you. Thanks, David. Okay, it's a wrap. All right. Everybody, Thank thanks again for coming and have be safe out there. It's a great night. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. So much. Bye. 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 Bye.